a couple weeks to kind of cast some vision for the new year. But, but back in September, we started this series about Jesus. Imagine that. We're talking about Jesus at church. Um, and, and we started with the question, who is Jesus and what is He like? And, and then we started looking at His ministry and the stories that are told uh, about Him and, and uh, gleaning lessons from those things. But the big question that we're asking in all of the series as we go through the life of Jesus is, is essentially this, can I trust Him? Will I trust Him? And can, I, can I lean everything, uh, all of myself, all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength on Him, and He'll come through for me? Because nothing else really matters if you don't trust Him. Like you can go through religious motions, and you can read the stories, and you can like, learn the Apostles' Creed and believe the right things, but if you don't really trust Jesus, there's nothing really transformational or life-changing about it. It's just another religion. But when you really trust Jesus, when you believe that He's done everything that you need for righteousness, and you lean all of your hope for salvation on Him, and a Spirit comes in you and lives in you, He's like living water flowing uh, into you, giving you life, satisfying your thirst, quenching you, letting you be filled. I had a dinner last night that I literally, I woke up and I was still full from. I was still full this morning. I didn't need breakfast. And that's what Jesus is like. He gives you your daily bread, and then you don't need to, you don't, you're not constantly hungry. You're not constantly searching for, for, for fulfillment. You're, he gives you living water. And then it says in Scripture, in John chapter 7, it, what Jesus says, when you drink this water, it will just flow out of you, and, and it will flow to others, and you'll bring life to other people. And so the big question, we're, we're looking at all of the things that Jesus did and said, and we're asking again and again, can I trust Him? Can I trust who He says He is? Can I, can I trust that that is who He is really like? Can I trust that, that what He teaches will, will benefit me, that it's actually a better way to do life? Can I, can I trust the body of Christ and, and, and say together with them, hey, me too, and actually be open and vulnerable and treat one another and love one another like family, and it will really change my life? Can I trust Him? And as you can see on the screen, we're starting a new series where we're going to continue looking at Jesus in this question. We're going to be studying the story that Jesus told about two kids who went up a hill to fetch a pail of, not really, it's not really. Some of you are like, wait, that's in the Bible? No, no, it's not. It's, it's not in the Bible. That's not a story that Jesus told you. Probably, if you know it, you probably know it from Mother Goose. But just in case you haven't heard it, here, here, let me just tell you a quick recap of the story. Apparently, there is a, a young couple named Jack and Jill. And they were thirsty, and they needed something to drink, so they grabbed a bucket and climbed a hill where there was a well. Somewhere along their journey for water, Jack has an accident, falls down the hill, suffers some type of head injury, and Jill comes tumbling down the hill after him, but no report on her injuries. That's the gist of it. I always thought Jack and Jill were brother and sister, like that's just the way I imagined it in my head. But Shakespeare, which he was around back around when the story's origination uh, of the story's origination, he talks about Jack having his Jill in kind of a romantic way. So the understanding of the point of the tale's origination is that they're involved romantically somehow. So I hope they're not brother and sister. Well, <laughs> so where I come from, we'd say only in Arkansas. Here you might say Kentucky, but anyway. Um, the story gives no indication as to how Jack fell, fell down or how Jill got caught up in the chain reaction. You know, maybe he tripped, anybody ever been hiking and you trip over a root in the trail? Like maybe he tripped over a root in the trail and he fell down the hill or maybe he wasn't paying attention and he wandered off the cliff or, you, you know, maybe Jill, why did Jill fall down? Maybe Jill got dragged down by Jack's mistake. Like he tried to catch something and he caught her and she, or maybe Jill pushed him over the cliff for insurance money and then came tumbling down after as kind of a cover-up so that she wouldn't be found guilty. We, we don't know, like, what was the condition of their relationship. But what we do know is that Jack and Jill were looking for something to satisfy their thirst, and they climbed a hill to find it, and in that quest to have their thirst filled and satisfied, an accident takes place, and the result is they're left lying at the bottom of a hill, hurt, injured, and I assume still thirsty. And that's what I want to talk to you about for the next six weeks. Have you, have you ever gone searching for something to satisfy your thirst, to fill your hunger? And on your quest, you're pursuing things you thought would fill you, you thought would complete your life, but you eventually just found yourself kind of lying at the bottom of a proverbial hill, hurt and injured, and still thirsty, not satisfied. John chapter 4, 
And if you're like, wait, did you say you started this series back in September? Yeah, it's taken me that long to get to John chapter 4. Um, John chapter 4 tells a similar story about a woman who keeps coming back to a well in an effort to satisfy her thirst. And both literally and figuratively, John tells us she's never satisfied. No matter how hard she works, climbing the hill and, and falling back down it over and over and over and over again. No matter how hard she works, she's up and down, up and down. She's hurt and she's thirsty and she's, she's trying to survive both practically, like in a day-to-day, like I just need to get some water to drink, and in her relationships, we'll later find out, in her relationships too. So a few, few important details about this story as we kind of introduce this series. First of all, the woman has had a hard life. She's had a hard life. We'll find out about her relationships, and, and we'll look at her life, and, and, and our temptation might be to judge her and like think of other people that we've cast judgment on in our lives, like, oh, that sounds like so-and-so. They just never seem to get it right. But she's had a hard life. See, what we forget is that though sin is a choice, it still hurts people. And so when we look at the woman on the, at the well, we should not only see ourselves because we're all sinners, but we should also have compassion. And that's what we see in Jesus who knows everything about her. And she's just trying to survive. She's just trying to figure things out. She's just trying to make sense of life and find the best way to do things the, with what she knows, the best way she knows how. But Jesus, uh, that's, that's the second thing. The third thing is that Jesus knows everything about her. He knows right where she's at. When, she, when, when they meet, he, he sees, he understands, and we'll talk about that in a minute, why. But he immediately ascertains, like, this is a hurting woman. She's hiding. She's ashamed. She, she doesn't want to be seen by other people, and he knows everything about her. And here's the most important thing is that in spite of that, in spite of the fact that he knows everything about her, knows everything about her hard life and the poor, cho- poor choices she's made or, the, or the, rotten, uh, the rotten experiences she's had at the expense of somebody else's poor choices, Jesus loves her. Jesus loves her. And so we're, we're going to look at uh, the whole story, which is John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, um, over the course of the next six weeks. But really, like the, the two verses of this story that will define the whole series are verses 23 and 24, right in the middle of the story. As Jesus converses with this woman, he says, A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and His worshipers must worship in spirit and truth in truth. So Jesus is is offering the woman a better life, just like He offers all of us. And He says it will take place on two levels, a spiritual level and a truth level. A spiritual level and a truth level. And the key word there is and, spirit and truth. There's not an or, which is often how we live. And, And we see in the conversation that the woman is living in this realm too. She wants to dwell on the spiritual like her heritage and stuff, but there's some truth that she needs to be confronted with. And, and we do this too. Just like the woman, we seem shocked that in doing one or the other, spiritual or truth, we continue in the same messed up patterns that we've always followed. It, we, we do like what the woman does where we say, well, as long as I have God, like as long as I believe the right things, as long as I'm spiritual, that's all that matters. I mean, yeah, I know that the Bible says this, but when I read it, I don't really get that. Well, yeah, you don't because it doesn't suit the life that you want to live. But Jesus says it's not enough to just have God, to believe the right things, to have said a prayer, to believe God said it, so I believe it, and that settles it. That's not enough. See, there's truth about the way that the world works. And so true worshipers will recognize that we, have, we need a relationship with God, but then we also need to recognize that that God that we have a relationship with has ordered the world in a certain way, and so he knows how to give us the best life. James says that every good and perfect gift comes from God. And so if we have a relationship with him, we understand that he's good and he's perfect and he can always be trusted to be that way. And so when he says to do something, it's not like just an option. It's, It's about your health of relationship with him and your health of the life that you're living. It's not enough to just worship in spirit. We, we, we like to sometimes say, you know, well, yeah, maybe I'm not getting that right in my physical life or my relational life or my sex life or my married life or my work life. 
My life might not even be really all that close to what God says is right or true, or what reality is proving works and what doesn't. That's what always amazes me is sometimes people say, well, yeah, I believe the right stuff, and their life is a mess, and they're asking me, how can I get my life figured out? And then you tell them the truth, and they're mad, and they're like, you can't tell me that. I'm like, I didn't. God did. That's what he says. That's how he says it works. It's truth. It's hard truth. It's uncomfortable truth. We don't want to make those changes in our life, and it's hard to see how they could happen, but it's not enough to just say, well, I have God, and he'll just fix it, right? No. That's spirit without truth. But on the other hand, we can be tempted to say, which is what the Jews say, and that's what this woman also points out, is as long as I do the right thing, as long as these Pharisees have formed this religion where as long as I do the right thing and, and, and I don't do stuff like that and that person and I keep the rules and I'm a good person or at least better than others, I don't even have to worry about the spiritual parts of my life. And it's not that the, Jew, the Jews thought they were worrying about the spiritual parts of their life. But what they didn't realize is that the Spirit is, is living and active, and he, he wants to actually get inside of us and not, not be a letter of a law, but a living, dynamic, loving, compassionate, merciful being moving through people's lives in that form and in that grace. In, in Matthew chapter 5, which we'll look at in a few weeks, when Jesus talks about salt and light, he, he f- follows that up. He closes the chapter with, the way that people will respond to my knock on the door is when you stop passing judgment and you start letting judgment be about your own heart and you just ask and knock and offer something that a person can receive, right? So, so there's, there is this other side where we want to worship all in truth but not in spirit, not recognize that God is bigger than the letter of the law. Just do the best that you can, do the right thing, believe the right stuff, it'll all work out, right? No, that's truth without spirit. You, you can't fix your life, either with truth or with spirit by itself. If, if you could, it'd already be fixed, right? It's another thing I'm always amazed at is it doesn't matter how long people have lived in broken patterns that when they come and talk to me, they want to figure out how they can fix it on their own. It'd be better, they, they want to share their own understanding of the Scripture instead of reading it in context and understanding what Jesus would say both then and now. They want to, they want to read it for their own understanding, and I just want to say, well, how's that working for you? I do say that. How's that working for you? I mean, really, you're, you're telling me that you have a particular understanding that apparently uh, supersedes the, the church and, and years of study and, 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 and prayer and understanding. How's that working for you? Why are you sitting here right now if you've got it all figured out? You don't need me to tell you what this, how, what this means or what God might have you do. You've got it figured out. If you, if you could fix your life, it'd already be fixed. The deepest and most intimate parts of our lives cannot just be fixed by doing your best to do them the right way if we don't also address the reality that there's something broken spiritually in in us. And no matter how much spirituality you have, no matter how much you go to church and how, how much you read the Bible and understand about God or think you understand about God, it doesn't matter if you're not actually living the truth that God teaches. You can't fix one without addressing the other. If you enter into a relationship with the spiritual, you'll be confronted with truth. And if you try to live by truth, it will be empty and without power, absent the spiritual. So let's look at this story, starting in John chapter 4, verse 1. It says, the Pharisees heard, remember we left off uh, with Jesus talking to Nicodemus and then John the Baptist. There's a story in here about John talking about who Jesus is. And and then it says, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So Jesus' star is rising, he gets wind of it, and he he says, you know what, I'm not about that, so I'm going to get out of here. And he goes back to his hometown area. Remember, Judea's in the south. And Galilee's in the north. Galilee, while it is kind of the epicenter of education, is not thought of highly because it's a poor region. It's not where the people of, of uh, wealth and, and good circumstance dwell because Jerusalem is in the region of Judea. So Ga- he goes back to Galilee uh, as he senses his star rising. And then it says in verse 4, as he sets out on this journey, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. He, he had to geographically, that's true. Like the most direct route from Judea to Galilee 
is to go through Samaria. But culturally, this is not true at all. So it's significant that John would say he had to because culturally, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. And, and a Jew would travel up to 60 miles out of his way to avoid going through Samaria. And remember, they're walking. He would walk 60 miles out of his way to travel from Judea to Galilee and Galilee to Judea. So when it says Jesus had to, when John says Jesus had to go through Samaria, he's saying something about Jesus' mission and about what the Spirit is saying to him in this moment, about what the Father is saying to him in this moment. When he says he had to go through Samaria, God was calling him there. He had to go through Samaria. So verses 5 and 6 continue with the story. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, which is actually right outside what would technically be the region of Samaria. It's right on the edge, near the plot of land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, does that give you comfort to know the humanity of Jesus? He's tired. He's doing ministry. He's traveling. He's, he's busy. And he's tired. He sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, before Facebook, before television, before radio and newspapers, you had wells. You had wells. This is where people went to get their news, to hear what's going on around town, to share the latest gossip with one another. They went to the well. Now, water is needed for all of the daily tasks of life, and, and it's the desert so it's all the more needed. And, and because it's the desert, everyone goes in the morning, in the cool of the day. And then again, if they needed a refill, they'd go again in the evening. Like they're doing baths that night. Anybody, you do baths with your kids at night, like on Saturday night. And that's what we do at our house. So if you're doing baths at night, you go get more water. But always in the cool of the day. You'd never go in the middle of the day. And the reason I tell you that is because here it says that Jesus is at this well at the sixth hour. The Jews started their day at 6 a.m. So to say it's the sixth hour means it's high noon. In other words, nobody is at the well normally at this time of day. It's not a time of great need because they've already gotten water in the morning, and it's too hot for anybody to want to be there. But Jesus sits down by the well in the middle of the day and meets someone, verses 7 and 8. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, John is really funny. He He's like a little whisperer. Like in his, all the time in his book, you'll find stuff in parentheses. You'll find these little explanations. Like he's telling you probably what they didn't understand then, but what he's beginning to understand now. It's almost like he's getting new revelation, and he just inserts that in there. Like just in case you're missing this, because I did at one point, let me just clue you in on what's going on. His disciples, it said, had gone into the town to buy food. In this case, he's just telling you where they're at. But oftentimes, as you read the book of John, you'll see John like, and by the way, Jesus did this because... John's good for that. So when it says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And, and there's so much taboo here. Anybody ever played that board game, Taboo? And, you know, with the buzzer? So, like, when you read this, I just want you to, as, and you picture the Samaritan woman approaching the well and Jesus sitting on it, I want you to picture that buzzer going, eh, 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 you know, like, you get, you're like, <laughs> no, you can't say that. You can't. That's, what, that's what's happening in this situation right now. The buzzer is going off like crazy, and the woman is probably approaching carefully, cautiously, giving the, the man who, by the way, she would be able to tell from his beard and his haircut and his dress from a distance, she'd be able to tell this is not only a Jewish man, but a Jewish rabbi. And so she would be approaching cautiously. She'd be, she'd be careful to, to walk uh, slowly and give him time to, to get out of the potential indignity of not only being in the presence of Samaritan, but a woman as well. Because Jews, and particularly Jewish rabbis, w would not be, and let that sink in. Jesus has close friends that are women. So talk about the, the nature of Jesus' countercultural ministry. But anyway, so there's, there's just a ton of taboo here. It, it would have been totally undignified for Jesus to stay near here. This woman would have been approaching cautiously, but he's not moving. What's up with that? She's probably taking a little step at a time. She's moving closely. She probably sees him not moving and is wondering, is he going to confront me? Because that wouldn't be uncommon either. Like a Jewish rabbi might feel it necessary to just go ahead and tell the Samaritans how wrong they are and how filthy and dirty and, and, and a, a defilement and a disgrace they are to the 
to the Israelite heritage. And so she might be wondering, is he going to confront me? And yet, she's so thirsty, <laughs> she keeps going. She keeps going. There's an encounter. She's willing to risk it because she needs water. So imagine her surprise when instead of chastising her, Jesus simply asks for a drink. And, and, and don't miss the significance of that either. He is setting the tone of the congregation, of the conversation, because it would have been, it would have made him culturally unclean to drink water that had been drawn by the hands of a Samaritan. Culturally unclean. I know there's, you don't have a category to understand that. I don't, I don't, I don't either. But, but to be unclean, to be named unclean, would be the most reviled thing that you could be, especially as a Jewish rabbi, to be unclean. No. Half of the religious laws in the Jewish system are all about how to be clean so that you can go into the temple, so that you can worship God. And just to have drank water that was drawn for him by a Samaritan woman would have made him unclean. So he's setting the parameters. He's saying, I am inviting you into this conversation, and I'm making myself vulnerable to you. That's the tone of the conversation. This is how he approaches the woman in this taboo situation. It, because, because and, and if you find that primitive or barbaric, that, you know, it would be unclean just to drink from something that a Samaritan drank from, remember that we're not too far removed in our own history of something like that. If you could just show the picture, that's what it was like. I can't drink from the same water fountain as you. So that should give you some idea of the tension in the moment. And she, she is totally aware of this. Look at what she says in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And, and John emphasizes the taboo here because he, said, he, again, he says, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. He, he says the Samaritan woman, both times inserting both details, Samaritan and woman. And then again, she says, I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I think she's looking at Jesus. She's like, have you, Rabbi, have you had a heat stroke? Are you okay, sir? Do you know where you're at? Are you aware of what's happening right now? The, the other day, uh, I fell asleep in the boys' room while I was, I, you know, we, one of us usually hangs out in there while they're going to sleep. And I fell asleep on the floor. And Casey came in and got me up. And she said that I got up, and I never really opened my eyes, but I just kind of walked through the hallway into the kitchen. I opened a box of malt, ball, malt balls, whoppers, and I just started eating whoppers. And she said she was just looking at me, and my eyes were still closed. And she was like, Stephen, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> and and I, said, I said, yes, I know what I'm doing. And, and then she, she said, I ate a few more, and then I, I put the box down. I really never opened my eyes, and I just went and you know, got dressed for bed and got in bed. <laughs> Stuffed my face with whoppers and then I went to bed. <laughs> and I think that's, that's what this Samaritan woman is looking at Jesus like. Jesus, Rabbi, do you know what you're doing? Do you understand? Are you awake right now? Is everything okay? Do you need me to call an ambulance? Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The, the most important part of this whole verse is that word who. If you knew the gift of God, that's important, but the gift of God and who it, who it is standing in front of you right now, that the God who gives the gift is actually standing in front of you, that the gift himself is standing in front of you. If you knew who. See, Jesus, in the, in the rest of this story, he's going to push through cultural, relational, and religious baggage from her life. She's going to ask a bunch of questions. She's going to challenge him at every turn. They're going to have kind of this debate. And Jesus is going to push through all of that. And he's going to say, stop looking at all that. Look at me. Stop looking at how it used to be. Look at who it is right now. Look at me. I'm the only one. I'm what's most important in your life. I'm the only one that can fix and satisfy what's missing and broken in your life. I'm the only one that can, that can fix and satisfy this broken system 
that you and all the Jews have been living in. I'm the, I'm the only one. Stop looking at all of that. Look at me. And Jesus, Jesus seems to recognize right away that there is much, a much deeper need in her life than simply filling up her pail with water. He knows there is something broken. We can see the same thing by asking this simple question. Why is she there right now? In the heat of the day, at the sixth hour, why is she there right now? The answer is she's hiding because she's ashamed. She doesn't want to hang out at the water cooler, right? I don't know if that even happens or if that's just a movie thing. Like, do people hang out at the water cooler at the office? I don't know. She doesn't want to hang out at the water cooler. She doesn't want to see people. She doesn't want to socialize. Why? Well, people can be mean and cruel. She's she's specifically trying to avoid the other women drawing water because women drew water in the culture. Men didn't. And why? Because she's ashamed and people... And maybe especially women can be really cruel with their words. And I don't mean this as a sexist thing. I just, more often than not, when I deal with crisis between women, it all comes down to things that were said. For, for guys, it's more about like issues of respect, like things that we did without thinking. But for women, man, some guys say stupid things too. Don't get me wrong. They do. I deal with guys who say dumb and hurtful things. But she's avoiding the well because of what's going on in her life. And the way people can treat people when they've got junk in their life can just be really mean and cruel. And the words that people will say, and they'll pretend like they're saying them to somebody else and not trying to say it loud enough that they'll hear it, but it's totally loud enough, and they know it. And so she's avoided. She doesn't want to be confronted by the shame and hurt in her life. She's had enough, and she's hiding. She doesn't want to be there in the heat of the day or in the cool of the day, because even in the cool of the day, it's hot for her. You might think about, this is, this is not the main point of the sermon, but you might think about, do I do that in my workplace? Do I do that in my school? Do I do that in my circle of friends? Do, do I make a place that's supposed to be safe, uncomfortable for, for someone, for some buddies? Do, do I make a place that's supposed to be safe, a, a place that's not safe at all? Am I, am I equally welcoming and compassionate and loving to every person that is in, uh, on my team at work, that is, that's in my, in my groups of friends? Am I just ask God, search my heart. Is that me? Have I, have I made somebody, have I highlighted somebody's shame to the point that they want to hide, that they'd rather be inconvenienced by life than to, than to be in the presence, be in your presence and have friends and be in a group of people? And then she sees Jesus at a time of day when nobody is supposed to be there. And she's probably like, great, just what I need. This rabbi obviously has a bone to pick. And yet she's meant with gentle and compassionate words. Jesus says, if only you knew. Can you just picture the compassion? He's already, he's already said, I'm willing to be unclean for the sake of you to, to get this. If only you knew the gift of God. Your life could be so much better, so much more alive. He's, I think he's referencing, and given the context, Jeremiah 2, verse 13, right at the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, God's telling him, my people have committed two sins or two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and, and they've hewed out or they've dug out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, not only, not only are they missing the living water, but they actually are, are going back to wells and jars that are incapable of holding water. And Jesus tells, us, tells this woman, if you knew who it is that you were talking to, you would have asked him to give you a drink, and it'd be living water, living water. And that's our story, too. We, we say to God, God, I don't, I don't believe you. I don't think I can trust you. I don't believe you have my best in mind. We don't ever say that out loud, but we live it, Right? I don't believe you can fully satisfy me. I don't think you can provide me with what I need. So I'm going to take my bucket and I'm going to go elsewhere. But the th crazy thing about it all is the next day we'll look at our bucket. We filled it with something and now it's empty. Where did it all go? I filled it up, but it's empty again. And we go back to the same old well with the same old bucket. And we keep wondering, why is my life empty? 
Why is it broken? Why, can, why can't I ever find satisfaction? Why do, why do guys always hurt me? Why, why, why don't girls see the kind of guy that I... Why, why this? Why that? Why, why doesn't my boss ever honor the work that I put in? Why? 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 And we're seeking satisfaction at wells that were never meant to give you satisfaction with buckets that never could hold water. Over and over and over again. We, we lean on substances. Sure, drugs and alcohol, but what about medication? I've talked to people who said, I just realized I lean on, I lean on medication with caffeine in it to help me be peppy and nice and good to people throughout the day. Pornography satisfies. Pornography is, is a way of, of taking the easy way to satisfaction relationally and sexually, but it leaves us empty. It's a bucket that can't hold water. Not just, and not just pornography. Don't just, ladies, don't just think of pornography in the hardcore way that, that guys tend to deal with more often. But think about the books you read and the movies you read and the fantasies that you formulate because a woman is more about the time, the conversation and the cuddling and the imagination of, of, of their husband in the kitchen with an apron around their waist and just serving, right? I mean, it's building this story, this narrative. It, you, you're being worked up all throughout the day. So when you watch movies and you read books to build fantasies in your head, that's pornography. It has the same effect on your mind. You want your husband, you want that guy to fulfill something that he was never made to fulfill. There's only one person that was made to fulfill it. Food. Food is a substance we lean on. It's a comfort that we lean on. When we have a bad day, what do we do? We go get a pint of ice cream. We eat half a pan of brownies. We, we sleep eat Whoppers. <laughs> I'm sure that's why I was doing it. We get fixated on stuff. If only I had that. And then we get the thing and we're like... Oh, Oh, but now I need this to go with it. And we obsess over approval and achievement. We want our boss to recognize us. We want, our, we want our wife to respect us. We want people to see the good that we're doing and know like, just how much we sacrifice. And, and if it's not our own achievement, it's our kids and our grandkids. Wells that don't have living water, buckets that can't hold water. And when we can't find that approval and achievement, when we can't find the success and the acknowledgement that we're looking for, if we can't find it in our bed, we'll seek it in somebody else's. Or we'll cut corners and we'll push unreasonably to make our nests better. If you don't get anything else today, get this, and this is in your bulletin You can, if you're taking notes. Don't try to get from anyone or anything which you can only get from God. That, that's, what, that's what Jesus is saying to this woman at the well. If you knew the gift of God, if you understood who God is, and who it is standing in front of you right now, you'd ask Him for a drink. Because He's the only one that can satisfy your thirst. Later we'll find out that this woman has been divorced five times and is in some kind of relationship with a man to whom she isn't married. We don't know the reasons for the divorces. We don't know all this, what, what led to this relationship, what kind of relationship it is. One commentator proposed that, that she may have been infertile. And so man, man after man, she gets married, and then they find out that he can't, she can't provide any children for him, and so they divorce her. Can you imagine having your worth tied to your ability to have children? Maybe some of you have gone there in your mind. She's cast aside again and again because she's unable to do something completely out of her control. Other commentators believe that the current relationship that Jesus refers to and her fear of the other women alludes to a pr promiscuous woman, that, that she's not been faithful, she's had affair after affair. But it doesn't really, it really doesn't matter because there's a larger issue at stake. It'll, I'm glad it doesn't tell us what the reason is because it allows us to focus on the, not just the symptoms, but act the actual problem. That she's going to wells that don't hold living water and buckets that can't hold any kind of water. I mean, in that culture, you could divorce somebody for any reason whatsoever. If you burnt the toast, uh, divorce a woman, I should say. You could divorce her. If you burnt the toast at breakfast, you could be divorced by 9 a.m. I mean, that's, you just write a letter saying, my wife, she doesn't know how to cook toast. I mean, how hard is that? I want a divorce. And the Pharisees, they'd say, okay, thanks for the letter. At least we know why, and we'll be able to back it up in court for you now. 
That's how, that's how easy it was to get divorced. But the bigger issue is that she, whether, whether it was her husband's fault or her fault or some combination of both, they were trying to be filled to quench their thirst on their own with things that aren't equipped to hold living water. And when you do that, everything falls apart. That's how it fell apart in the beginning. A couple, not Jack and Jill, but Adam and Eve, they had perfect intimacy with each other and, and with God. And, and the, Bible, the Bible says, if you ever want to just have a fun time, go search like, uh, the Bible told with Legos or something on Google. And it's, it's amazing what people come up with. But Adam and Eve, they're perfectly intimate with each other and with God. And the Bible says that they were naked and had no shame. And that's not just a literal thing that it's talking about, but, but, but the meaning, the Hebrew meaning, the spiritual meaning is, is that they had nothing to hide, that they're completely bare before each other and before God and had absolutely no shame in their hearts. Nothing to be ashamed of, and they felt no shame. They, had, they, they wished for nothing, and they had nothing to hide or hide from. None of us have experienced that in its fullness, right? We all wish for things. There was this awkward stage in my first year of marriage where I had to get comfortable with sharing a house with somebody, and like as much as, as, much as you look forward to sex as a married couple, there's some awkward stuff to work through, Right? And everyone's like, oh, pastor, don't go there. That's weird. It's awkward. See, but that's naked with shame. So we all live in that now. But the Bible says they were naked and had no shame. They had perfect intimacy, both with people and with God. Yet, they still had the same temptation to, be to believe that God has what's best for you or He doesn't. The devil came to them and said, are you sure? Are you sure that's what God said? Are you sure He's not hiding something from you? They had perfect intimacy. They had perfect knowledge. The answer is yes, we're sure. He's held nothing back from us. But the devil gets us to start thinking, are you sure the water wouldn't taste better over there? And when they decided to sin, two things happen immediately. Number one, they're ashamed. Intimacy with God and each other is broken. And nakedness is now taboo. Now taboo. They're, they're ashamed of being naked with each other and they're ashamed before God. They no longer have perfect intimacy. And secondly, they hide. They hide from each other by sowing the fig leaves, and they hide from God by trying to hide behind a tree. As you can see, they're not very invisible. And just like the woman at the well, she's, they're ashamed and hiding. Intimacy has been broken. They're, they're drinking water that does not satisfy thirst. They've drunk from water that can't satisfy thirst, and they've broken their buckets. And into that, God walks. He says, where are you guys? Intimacy's been broken. They're no longer without shame before him. And he knows that. But he's calling them. He's calling them. Just like Jesus sitting at the well, waiting, this woman walking carefully. There's shame. There's stuff she doesn't want to, to address. But Jesus walks right, just stays, stays his ground, calls her out of hiding, invites her into a conversation, says, I'll come to your level. I'll become unclean even. But there's fallout too. The fallout of Adam and Eve is, is what the woman at the well is living, and it's what we live in too. The, the fallout for women is that they'll have a tendency to go to the well of men to find their identity. The Bible says that, that, that they will be ruled over by men. But women are going to have a tendency to try to get something out of men that they cannot provide for them, and in demanding that out of men will actually destroy their relationships with them. There, there's, there's, it really happens in two ways. Either you allow your value and worth and identity to be determined by the approval of men, or you're, you're seeking value, worth, and identity by proving yourself as better than men. But do you understand that they're really the same thing? There's two sides of the same coin. You're either trying to prove that you're better than a man, or you're seeking your approval in a man. But both, in both cases, your value and your worth and your identity is determined by who? somebody who wasn't made to speak and determine your value. And as a result, men, we, 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 the Bible says that we'll have to work, and it won't, be a, it won't be a work of purpose and meaning anymore. It'll be a labor and a chore. And so we'll be weighed, by, weighed down by bosses and by hours, and, and our tendency will be then to take control of the one thing that we can have control over, and that's, that's the women in our lives. And, and we'll lord our authority over them, and we'll, 
will mistreat them because we want them to be something that they were never made to be. We want them to be our purpose and our meaning. We want them to show us the respect that we were made, the respect and the meaning that we were made to get from the purpose and mission that God gave us as men. And part of that purpose and mission is to serve and love our wives the way that Christ serves and loves the church, even so much as to lay down our lives for them. But instead, we lord authority over and we suppress and that's the curse of the garden. There's fallout. There's consequences. But in both cases, identity is found in something other than God. It's found in some things and some ones. The bottom line is that Jack makes a terrible God, and Jill makes a terrible God. You can be a good husband, you can be a good wife, but you cannot be a good God. You cannot be a good God. Whether you're single or married, we need to stop looking for Mr. Perfect, women. If you're single, you need to shorten your list. Really, your list could be this. It could be that the man is so in love with Jesus that his whole life operates from serving and loving others the same way. I mean, sure, feel free to have some preferences. But if you are looking for Mr. Perfect, you're going to be sorely disappointed because there's only one Mr. Perfect, and his name is Jesus. That none of these jokers here, single or married, including yours truly, is Mr. Perfect. You won't find him on Match.com or Tinder or anywhere else. Single or married men, do you know what a unicorn, the Easter bunny, and the woman of your dreams has in common? <laughs> They're all figments of your imagination. In a literal sense. Certainly you can love your wife and serve her as though she, has, she is becoming the woman of your dream. She's becoming the woman that God made her to be. There's no other woman I would rather love and serve than my wife, and that makes her the woman for me and the woman of my dreams. But she's not perfect. And if I expect her to be and demand of her to be something that she cannot be, it will hurt her and it will hurt me and it will hurt our marriage. Your husband cannot provide for you all that you need, and if you demand that of him, you'll destroy him, yourself, and your marriage. I'm not saying, so don't go and say, Pastor said, don't try and be a good husband, don't try and be a good wife. So I'm not saying that. But I'm saying your identity is not in your husband. Your identity is not in the man that you hope will be your husband. Your identity is not in your wife. It's not in the woman that you hope that she would be. Your identity is in someone else whose value is always secure and who makes your value always secure. And his name is Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this. This is verses 8 and 9. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one could boast. It is the gift of God. And verse 10 goes on and it says, For we are his workmanship. The word there literally means poem, but the larger meaning, some translations say masterpiece, some translations say handwork, handiwork, some say workmanship, but the literal meaning would be master work. Master work. You are God's master work, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Maybe today the last word you'd use to describe yourself is masterpiece or master work. Maybe you have a hard time believing that God made you and loves you. Maybe you have a hard time believing that He cares about your hard life, that He's not fed up with your mistakes, and He's waiting to have an appointment with you. Maybe, maybe like the woman at Sychar in Samaria, Jesus is waiting to meet with you this morning. I'm going to ask the band to come now. They're going to teach us a new song called, called Oh, Come to the Altar. And today's message is called Leave the Well, Come to the Altar. And that's what I'm going to invite you to do now. If you, if you recognize that I demand things of people that they can't fulfill, if I, that I seek to be satisfied somewhere else other than Jesus. And Jesus today, He's sitting here, and He, and he wants to say to you like He said to her a couple thousand years ago, if you only knew, if you only knew, woman of God, if you only knew, man of God, the gift of God, if you only knew it. 
and who it is that asks you for a drink. If you knew the price that I was willing to pay, if you knew that I would become unclean for you, that while you're still a sinner, that I'd stretch out my arms and serve you in love in the most ultimate way, if you only knew. If, if you knew that I wanted to make jars of clay out of your lives so that you could be filled up and poured out with living water, if you only knew. You don't need to ask anybody else or anything else for a drink. If you only knew you could ask me for a drink and never be thirsty again, you could be fully satisfied, fully quenched, that you could trust me. If you only knew that the gift of God is Jesus, that the thing that you can't get from anyone or anything else is, is Jesus. That's what he says in John chapter 7, verse 37. He says, stop asking for someone else to give you a drink. I am the living water. Stop demanding from your relationships what you can only get from Jesus. Stop demanding from your work the purpose and mission that you can only get from Jesus. Stop demanding from your own life. Stop putting expectations over yourself to fill your jar in a way that only Jesus can fill. Stop carrying buckets around that are broken, that are leaking. Leave the well. Come to the altar. One of the ways that we talk about this around here is, I say, I've said a few times, there's two deals on the table. All the time, there's two deals on the table. And today, the deal is simple. You can keep going to the same well, the well that's left you thirsty and unsatisfied, the well that's hurt you and broke you before. Or you can leave the well, and you can come to the altar of Christ. And you can say, I don't know what this looks like. I don't even know for sure that I can trust you, but I can tell you one thing. The well that I've been going to, it still it leaves me thirsty every day. And I keep coming back to it. So we're going to, you can sit in your seat and worship along, but it, I, w- I would encourage you, if you've been seeking satisfaction somewhere else, and you're feeling the Spirit of God, say, why don't you just come to the altar? Don't ignore that voice. If, if it's, if it's, impressed upon your mind, if it's invading your mind and you just can't get it out of your mind, that's the Spirit of God. You're not, you're not imagining things. You're not dreaming that up yourself. God's talking to you, and He's making the same invitation that He made to Adam and Eve in the garden when, when He killed the animals instead of them. He's making the same in, invitation as He made to the woman at the well. Leave the well. Come to the altar. Stop trying to be satisfied by other things. I'm all you need worship together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calm. you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Who oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was but with precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. 
invitation our wonderful Savior has just said anytime any place can be an altar so you might go from this place and ask God search my heart is there something I feel empty I feel average I feel mundane life feels like it's kind of selling me a, a short stick God would you search my heart and just show me if there's there's a hole in my bucket and and then you can make an altar in your car you can make an altar at the side of your bed at your kitchen table. Those are those all three of those places have been altars for me at time. Any place can be an altar because of what Jesus has done. And, and so if you realize that you've been going to an empty well or a well that doesn't satisfy, you can leave the well and you can come to the altar and you can say, Jesus, I want to be I want to drink from the well of living water and be satisfied only in him. 
as you, as you go, remember who it is that is offering you a drink, who it is that offers the gift of God. Remember that the gift of God is Jesus. And let, let, that, let that sink in and let that influence the way that you live your life this week, the way that you encounter him when, when the ball drops and it lands on your foot. <laughs> to say, God, I know that every good and perfect gift comes from you, and the gift of God is Jesus. And so even though this stinks and I don't understand it, I trust you. I want to drink from your living water. Fill me again, satisfy my thirst, and help me to be a vessel by which living water can come to others. So if you just hold out your hands and receive this benediction, God, because you give us water, that always satisfies. We surrender to lean our lives on you and to become vessels by which living water will flow out to all people, all nations, every person that you brought into my life. In Jesus' name, 